Hey everybody, Rob here. It's time for our 400th video and a couple of stories from the Pro Revenge archives. First one, Toyota Service Advisor works his bloody foot off. Let's jump right in. As we release video number 400, I want to say a sincere thank you to each one of you who have watched my videos and are subscribed to the channel. Without you, this channel wouldn't be where it is right now. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. I worked at a Toyota service department for a few months and it was terrible. But today was the worst day I have ever had at any dealership. The layout is really horrible. It's in South Carolina where it's 95 Fahrenheit outside in February with 90% humidity. We do not have AC in the service drive where I work and customers arrive. They removed our desk fans since they looked bad and put a big fan in the center of the room. It doesn't help us at all, but it looks nice. We usually have 100 plus appointments a day split between six to nine advisors depending on staff. We had six who knew what to do and three newbies who are just learning, oil, and 710 are the same fluid. If a customer comes in, we greet them, get the info from the car, then figure out what their concern is. You also try to sell them on stuff based off their past decline services and the pop-up saying add engine oil change to the plug-in electric only car, so it's got issues. You need to get a customer in and out quick without issues and with the most stuff to get paid. I was hired by an old manager of mine at his new position when he saw on Facebook me and my fiance move back into town. We're paid based off labor hours sold, percent of parts profit we sell, bonuses for CSI, customer service, bonuses for selling the most of the monthly item, air filter, battery, brakes, etc., and no minimum pay, no hourly, daily, anything. Coming from my old job, with my numbers from there, I would be making twice as much. One of the conditions of my hire is I'm not to drive customers' cars, as their insurance wouldn't cover me. During my first two weeks of learning on the job their programs, my old manager gets an offer to move to another store and is replaced by this guy who is best to call Chad. Chad was this hotshot who was going to set us up to really be a top tier service department and help us manage flow much better. Well, Chad came from a store who worked on R&R, which is basically Windows 1998 BC. He knew nothing about the programs we were using or honestly what an emoji is. Wanting to help Chad out, I showed him some options for programs that would help us keep track of notes, reduce away time from desks for us, and also keep our technicians at their bay. He got us licensed to use them and I set everything up. I set up our new programs and also started changing our old ones. I really wanted to make things easier day to day. I hated wasting paper and walking to parts to tell them something or to ask my technician for an update. One of the programs was a flagging system, showing just profiles you are assigned or create. Certain flags show priority, etc., and you could see all notes on all cars. Message parts and flag to your parts person. Instead of having to type customer state, vehicle is vibrating at speeds of 45 miles per hour and above, please inspect, then a new line, customer requests oil change, a new line, customer would like vacuum but no wash, and so on. I made it so we could click vibration, front left, 45 miles per hour, LOF, suck no wash, and it would automatically add the text and print with correct part numbers for oil filters, the right oil spec and capacity, and everything out nicely. I did this for about everything I could think of and kept adding more and more. I had it auto send just part numbers, ticket info, and book lines for internal, customer, warranty, extended warranty out correctly to save time for everyone. Made sure current recalls would also always print based off VIN so they weren't forgotten. I also made sure our loaner vehicles could be checked in or out easier and being able to have instant access to all of past agreements if something is found in the car or damage is found. These are just some examples, but I basically just copied my profile with permissions for my boss and showed him how to give it to other people. Skip six months, no raise, no uniform I was supposed to be provided, and coming in on my days off to help with the programs. 
It's Monday, and this week, I had a nail go straight through my foot at work. I Ubered to the hospital down the road, making sure to not remove the nail. It got bandaged up, but still going in every day for my 12 plus hour shifts and walking around all day. From my desk, it's probably 100 yards to the car wash, 40 yards to the shop, etc., because people still don't always use the system, and porters aren't bringing cars up. I'm not insured by them, but still have customers asking politely, where the f*** is my Prius? I was here for 26 minutes. So, I hobble down to the car wash, where it most likely is, and drive it through and up. My team for Saturday, four people, had one person quit on Wednesday, and one person had a funeral to leave early for. The other guy was new, so he was slow to get stuff done. My boss says he'll come in and help. Wednesday, we lock it at 60 appointments since we have short staff up front and back. Saturdays are half technicians and no diagnosis days. We do take walk-ins too. Thursday, it's at 80 and we tell our boss to lock it. Again, on Friday before closing, we see 110 appointments. He never locked it and took Friday off. Come Saturday morning, we had 130 appointments from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. I'm having to walk around a lot and ended up bleeding through three pairs of socks and bandages I swapped out. I had to chase down about 80% of our customers' cars because our porters that showed up were goofing off. I had 53 open tickets at 12 p.m. We had a four-hour wait for walk-ins and two with appointments. Usually, it would take us 30 minutes for an oil change from ticket printed to customer paying just for reference. I haven't had lunch or a snack since they banned food and drinks at our desks. My friend is about to leave for the funeral, so I cover his remaining tickets, telling him not to worry about me. Then, my boss leaves for lunch, throwing his 20-ish tickets on my desk. So, I'm now 110 tickets deep, helping the new guy with stuff, moving cars, and trying not to pass out. Oh, and it's 95 Fahrenheit outside, no AC in our covered area, not inside, and 90% humidity, we didn't even get a breeze. I would stop by the water fountain near the car wash and dream about running through with the windows down and mouth open to cool off. It gets to 3pm and I'm rescheduling people who come in, trying to get everyone out when their cars are done but have to limp them down to pull them in front to leave after they pay. My boss still isn't back and the new guy quits. He wasn't doing much, but it's his first week and today sucks. I end up getting in one car and blood from my sock and shoe drips onto our paper mats in the car. I cleaned everything out, vacuumed the car, washed it and pulled it up. Customer went apeshit that she saw blood on the disposable paper mat. About the weight, not getting a discount for her non-appointment service, and demanded to speak to my manager. This was it because I wanted to talk to him too. I called him up and was sent to voicemail. I explained to his mailbox, also texted him a brief summary. I then called the GM to explain that I have been alone for about three hours, dealing with an uncapped amount of customers, five technicians walked out. I'm still not recovered from my workplace injury and that I'm finishing my paperwork to take my lunch break at 4 p.m with at least 50 customers still waiting. Boss shows up when I'm about to leave to eat my lunch I brought, knowing their provided lunch would be gone before I could set my bloody foot in the break room. He told me that in our state, I'm not legally allowed a lunch break during a shift, and I have to stay to finish out the customers on my tickets. It's after our regular hours at this point. I mentioned being here since 6 a.m. to open shop and pre-printing everything saying I just need to relax, and he said, you didn't even clock in this morning, so unless you do what I say, you aren't getting paid. Once again, I'm paid commission here, and percent of parts profit for stuff sold, I don't even get one cent an hour. So I walked to my station, removed all of everyone's login copies of my permissions, deleted all of my notes, deleted all of my warranty macros, I set all the spreadsheets, and reset every custom line I added to our programs. Since I was the original profile, this reset everything for everyone. When I walked out and got a call, when I got to my car asking, 
Why isn't your login able to collect credit cards? Sounds like a problem. Good luck with that. I have never taken ecstasy, but that drive home was about what I would imagine it as. To make things better, I had two cars there, so I had to go back to pick one up while my fiancé is saying how I should burn the place to the ground and how happy she is that I won't be working for Chad anymore. We see that the lights are still on for my GM's office and the service department with both of them there. I got in my car, wanted to do a huge burnout, but I got a phone call. My GM asked me to come back at a pay raise and less hours, but I knew it was BS. He wanted to know what went wrong with that day and if I would come inside to discuss it with Chad and him, I just hung up and went home. Chad ended up getting let go the following month since he couldn't get things back up to speed. My good friend ended up getting moved to service manager for a bit, then ultimately moved to Mercedes as a part person, now director. I ended up going to BMW for a bit after that and got promoted past Chad's position. Well OP, I think they didn't give you a uniform because they couldn't find any pants big enough to hold those balls of yours. Well done getting revenge on the whole service department. On to our next story, boss didn't pay me so I started a company out of spite to put him out of business. Let's jump right in. The year was 2008 and I was 9 years into operating a landscape company. I had done moderately well for myself being able to purchase a home, pay off student loans and start a family. I employed 4 people during the what I call work season which for us is March through November. December through February, we lay off our workers and go on hiatus for the most part. Side note, our company focused mainly on maintenance, and in the Pacific Northwest, once all the leaves are picked up from the autumn, there really isn't much maintenance to be done. I had that year developed a relationship with a home builder who hired me to care for his personal home and very much liked our work. He asked us to start bidding on installing the landscapes to the homes he built. Sounds easy, right? Well, remember, we focused mainly on maintenance, so my crew didn't have a ton of experience in the install detail of landscape, and the homes this guy built were not track homes or your cookie cutter type neighbors you find in the suburbs. No, a small home for him was 3,500 square feet on a 25,000 square foot lot, and an average size he developed was 8,500 to 10,000 square foot homes with all the bells and whistles. He was more generous in his landscape budgets than many of the contractors I'd met, and we were off to what I had hoped would be a great partnership. We finished the first four projects he handed us, and it was now the beginning of December when my maintenance side of things dropped off. This home builder came to me and asked if I would like to keep my maintenance crew working for the winter, working for him. I knew his next home project wasn't set to break ground, till late January, so I asked what he had in mind. He told me that he and his son had been experimenting with spray foam insulation in their homes and had decided to invest in purchasing equipment to start their own company. To purchase the equipment on this level was about $100,000. I said I would talk to the crew and get back to him. The next week we signed a contract to work with him for 3 months at a specified pay rate for 5 of us. He was confident he had enough work to keep us busy for the next three months. First job was insulating this incredible house for this plastic surgeon who spared no expense for the gadgets and material that he put into his home. Next was government buildings on Fort Lewis. Next was a new apartment complex, etc, etc. Now, this builder who I was friends with was not my day-to-day -day boss while insulating. It was his son, who is younger than I and a bit of a jerk but we got along fine and all seemed well. The father owned the insulation company, but had very little to do with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Hardly saw him for three months. Now, being a contractor myself, I was used to not getting paychecks every two weeks like most working folks. I would get paid once a month from my maintenance accounts for the previous month of service, and it didn't all come in at once. Sometimes people forget to pay on time. My crew, though, was used to getting paid in a timely manner, and after the first month of work and receiving no check from my new boss, I inquired when to expect a check. He assured me that once the check started rolling in, that we would see our money. I totally get how that works, 
especially for a new company trying to get off the ground. So, I paid my guys to keep the peace on my end, and my boss and I worked out an agreement that I would keep track of everything paid and that he would cut me a check once he was able to. I also had an outstanding landscape invoice out with the father of over $10,000 that I wasn't really worried about because he was not always super quick about payment. Not that I had to hound him about it, but you understand. Now we are at the end of February of 2009, and it was time to gear up for the new season of landscape maintenance and put my crew back to work outside. Still no payment from insulation or last landscape project. Things got ugly real fast as I started daily phone calls to the son now that we didn't see each other as often. I called the father who more or less ignored me. The son stopped answering my calls and texts, etc. The father never had a straight answer for me. Now mid-April of 2009, most communication has stopped on their end. I filed a contractor's lien on the landscape project to be paid out before the house sold, which prompted a call from the father to invite me to his home for lunch and a talk. I accepted thinking he was going to offer me a deal of some kind based on my past history with him. He basically told me that he had been over the years screwed out of money by different people and that it was something that I was going to have to learn to live with. My response, I've been screwed out of money that people owe me as well, just not by anyone I considered a friend. I left his house determined to stick it to him. May 5th, 2009, I started a spray foam insulation company with the same level of equipment that he had, but about a year less experience than he had. May 7th, I get a call from the father asking a landscape question, acting as if we were on normal terms. My response was, oh, I don't landscape anymore, I spray foam. What are you talking about, he asked. When I explained to him that I was operating a spray foam insulation company, he ended the phone call rather quickly. I then received a phone call from his son five minutes later, who had ignored my calls for the last many weeks, threatening me that he would destroy my hopes of making it as an insulator and that no little landscaper could or would make it in this community. Side note, with my newly formed company, there was now approximately four to five companies in the Pacific Northwest performing this kind of service. It is a small circle of people in the insulation world, and the word gets around pretty quick who does what, etc. Our very first job was handed to us by our material supplier, which happened to be his supplier, and that job was a fix. Apparently, that very first job we had worked on, that plastic surgeon's house, was insulated incorrectly and poor workmanship. Luckily, my only involvement on that house was prep work and cleanup. We ended up removing all of the insulation and reinstalling it, about a $65,000 job, which the owner of the house turned around and sued my old boss for, and won. We then acquired the government contract at Fort Lewis, that he had because of poor communication on his part. Anyway, we systematically took apart his company by being better and honest with people. The story spread in the spray foam insulation world and we became somewhat hero-like in this region because they had screwed so many people over. Oh, and at that time, if you might remember, the housing market took a giant dump and guess who had four very large houses sitting out there that couldn't sell? Yep, the father, who ended up going bankrupt by mid-09. The son, on the other hand, kept his head above water somehow a bit longer, but in October of 09, I got a call from a repo man asking if I knew the son and where to find his spray foam equipment. My father-in-law happened to be a retired cop and PI, and I put him on the case to find said equipment. Two days later, he called with the address and specific location of the equipment, which was behind a barn on an island with the tires aired down. I made the call to the repo man, and two hours later, he called me from his lot as he was pulling in with a very large trailer behind his truck, asking where he could send the bounty check. I kept the insulation business for about three years before being bought out by another company. I also kept the landscape company and still run it to this day. Moral to the story, landscapers may work in the dirt and seem simple, but piss one off and they will ruin you. 
We hear a lot of stories of people spending a lot of money to take revenge on someone. It's nice to see one where OP made a bunch of money in the process of getting revenge. Great work. I'd like to thank both OPs for posting their stories to the Pro Revenge subreddit. You can visit them at the links in the description below. Please go there and give them an upvote. Once again, this is Rob from Karma Comment Chameleon saying thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit that subscribe button, drop a like, and share it with your friends. And we'll see you in the next one.